Hello, everybody, and welcome to our session today on understanding more about eating disorders for those of you trained as mental health first aiders. As you know, this is a project between Mental Health First Aid England and Thrive London. My name's Anne Marie Gowan, and I'm from Unlock Your Wellbeing. So, a big welcome to you all, and thank you for joining us on this really important workshop. And the aim here is to deepen our understanding of eating disorders and making sure that we can apply our mental health first aid skills to anyone affected by an eating disorder, whether that's the person themselves who has a diagnosis, but it might also be a family member, a friend, a colleague, etc., who's concerned. I'm a mental health first aid trainer and consultant, and I'm particularly interested in the areas of prevention, recovery and education in all things to do with mental health and well-being. I've had my own lived experience of severe mental illness, which wasn't an eating disorder, um, but I've recovered from that. And now I'm passionate to let people know that recovery happens and to increase the knowledge and understanding around all kinds of mental illnesses. And we must remo remove the stigma that's often associated with that. So the aims of today's session. So you're going to re refresh your knowledge of the different types of eating disorders. We're going to think about the causes, the treatments, and lots of other sources of help and support. And also thinking about the effect on the family and friends of anybody who has an eating disorder. And importantly for you, how can you apply your lovely mental health first aider skills? So by the end of the workshop, the outcomes are that you recognize the symptoms of an eating disorder, provide that initial help, guide the person towards appropriate professional help, and also be aware of other supports and other help that's available. All the while being mindful of your own well-being, as we always say to you as mental health first aiders. So we're going to start with some myth busting. So I'd like to thank the charity Beat that we will be mentioning more than once in this session um, for, uh, for help with putting this together. So the first myth, think about this one. Eating disorders are a choice. Now have a little think, why is that not true? And let's have a look at the facts. So the facts are that an eating disorder is a complex illness. There's no single cause, although um, we're going to be looking at the causes and they might be that combination of biological, psychological and sociocultural factors. An eating disorder is extremely depressed, distressing, both for the individual themselves, but is also distressing for their loved ones. They're often accompanied by really powerful feelings, um, such as shame, for example. They require specialist treatment, but the message here is that people can and do get better. So in summary here, eating disorders are a serious mental health condition and are never a personal choice. So what about this myth? People with an eating disorder are vain and attention seeking. Have a little think, why is that not true? Perhaps you overheard saying, somebody saying something like this. What might your argument be against that? Let's have a look at the facts. So although that we know that there is an association between body dissatisfaction and an eating disorder, eating disorders are very much more serious than that. And they are not about somebody being vain or wanting to look a certain way. They're serious diagnosable illnesses. They're not a lifestyle choice. They're not a phase. They're not someone attention seeking. And in fact, you might all know this, that many people who are diagnosed with an eating disorder go to great lengths to hide it and to keep it a secret. So very far from attention seeking. The next myth, you must be underweight to have an eating disorder. What do you think about that one? Why is that one not true? The facts are here that although we often do think of an eating disorder as somebody with um, anorexia, for instance, and, and that is typical of people with anorexia, there are other eating disorders where a person may apparently be a healthy weight or overweight. So it's not just about being underweight. And 
in any case, for somebody who has anorexia and the one of the aims of treatment is to restore their weight, but that's only one aspect of it. And even when they might be considered to be a healthy weight, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're recovered, because what we need to also address are the thoughts and behaviours driving that eating disorder. Myth four, eating disorders only happen to young girls. Why is that not true? Let's have a look at the facts. Research shows that eating disorders don't discriminate. They're equal opportunities. They'll affect people of all genders, ages, ethnicities, sexual orientations, weights, and socioeconomic status. Just to look at some figures, 6.4% of people in England have experienced symptoms of an eating disorder. 1.25 million people have an eating disorder. And around 25% of those experiencing an eating disorder are male. Up to 16% of people who identify as LGBT plus experience symptoms of an eating disorder. Other groups of people with increasing levels of uh, eating disorders are people of color, men, older people. And when we look at these groups of people, we might think that there's you know, good reason when we think of the drivers behind a, um, an eating disorder, it might well be people who are struggling to cope people who may have um, reasons not to fit in with society, perhaps. What about myth five? Eating disorders are a diet gone wrong. Why is that not true? Although we do know that for some people, um, they may have started with a diet, they are not in that sense a diet gone wrong. An eating disorder is significantly different from somebody on a diet. They are not a diet gone wrong. They are serious mental health disorders. And the driver for somebody to become so unwell as an eating disorder is, is not a diet. Something else takes over. And the final myth I ask you to think about. People don't recover from an eating disorder. It's genetic. Why is that not true? So although there is some evidence that uh, genes contribute to anybody developing an eating disorder or some of the other mental illnesses, it doesn't mean that they can't recover. Genes are only one part of the equation. There's a complex mix of risk factors here. Um, full recovery from an eating disorder is possible with the right help, with the right support, and ideally with that support and help coming at an early stage. A full recovery is possible. And as mental health first aiders, of course, that is exactly where we operate from, that hope in recovery, whoever it is that we're supporting. So final uh, reminder here is that eating disorders are not about food or weight. They're rather somebody's attempt to deal with huge emotional distress um, and other stress-related issues. So let's have a little reminder of some of the eating disorders. Now you've got your manuals of course and they've got lots of information in, so let's have a look at what the eating disorders are. Anorexia nervosa, now this is one that pe most people have heard of and when somebody has anorexia they are trying to keep their weight as low as possible by not eating enough food. Um, and you will sometimes hear of people eating things that are non-food, such as um, tissues and cotton wool, things like that, just to stop their hunger pangs, but they're not food. They're not going to be getting any calories from them. And um, very often that is accompanied by excessive exercise too. So one way or another, they are not going to be taking those calories in. They're either going to not take in the calories or if they do, they're going to try and exercise them off as quickly as possible. And of course, we know that people can become exceptionally unwell and they can clinically starve. People with anorexia will often have a very distorted image of their own bodies, thinking that they're fat even when they're underweight. The next eating disorder is bulimia nervosa. And here people will be caught up in that cycle of eating large amounts of food, 
which you might call binging, and then trying to compensate for it by purging. So sorry to be a little bit graphic here, but what we're talking about here is um, people vomiting, taking laxatives, taking diuretics, fasting, over-exercising, um, feeling really guilty because of the binge and purging afterwards. Binge eating disorder in, is different to bulimia in that, yes, there is that binge eating, but there is not the purging, there are not the purging behaviours. And people often talk about um, a, a real sort of loss of control over their eating, that they're not even there, they're kind of somehow disconnected from it. It's impossible for them to stop. Um, and often they can't even remember what they've eaten. Um, there sometimes are some ritualistic elements to binges. You know, sometimes people do it on a certain day or a certain time. They buy special foods. Maybe they lay the table in a certain way. But for others, it's more spontaneous than that. Now, this is not people loving large amounts of food. They are not savoring every moment here. People eat very, very rapidly. They are not savoring it or tasting it. Um, as I say, they almost enter that trance-like state. Um, there's a great deal of distress around those binges, often during, but certainly afterwards, huge amounts of distress there. Another eating disorder um, is called OSFED, which stands for Other Specified Feeding and Eating Disorder. And what this means is you have an eating disorder, but it's not clearly anorexia, bulimia or binge eating. It might have elements of all of them. So there might be a blend or a mix of, sem of symptoms. However, don't run away with the idea that because of that, it's not as serious. These can be very serious indeed. It used to be called EDNOS. You might hear that term um, around sometimes. And EDNOS is now called OSFED. And then we have something called ARFID, which is a little bit different from those um, eating disorders there, but just worth of a mention. Um, people with ARFID, which is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, severely limit the types of food they will eat and avoid vast amounts of different food groups completely. You might hear, for instance, uh, you know, sometimes on daytime television, you know, they'll have a guest on and they'll be saying, oh, my child will only eat cheese and onion crisps, for instance, and that's all they will eat, or an extremely restricted number of foods. Um, now, sometimes this is because of a sensory avoidance. So there are certain smells, textures, temperatures of food, which really they are trying to avoid. And that might be because it's associated with a really unpleasant memory or experience that they've had associated with eating certain types of food. So previously they may, for instance, um, have vomited or choked on that type of food and it's left them with a fear of that food. So whatever the reason, um, uh, for whether it's restrictive eating, whether it's people with anorexia or bulimia, people are not going to be getting all the essential nutrients they need for their health, for their development and for their ability to function. And we know that there are um, ever younger people um, being diagnosed with anorexia, for instance. You know, we, we know that there are children as young as eight and nine in inpatient units with anorexia and this is you know so important because their development is being um, interfered with and, and interrupted if you like so the earlier the treatment the better so let's think about what we know about the causes of eating disorders and let's be honest here we don't usually know exactly why one person develops an eating disorder and another one doesn't however what we can say um, is that sometimes people uh, might develop an eating disorder because of those social pressures to be thin. Those social pressures, social media, fashion magazines that have been airbrushed, so they are completely unrealistic. Um, they are not recognizable as regular uh, sized people. And so some pressure can come from that. There's also... Um, quite a lot of people who have experienced an eating disorder talk about it as something that they could finally feel in control of. Maybe in their life they don't feel in control of very much at all and then suddenly they think 
ah, hang on a minute. I can control what I eat and drink. So they are trying to wrestle back, if you like, some control in their life. Um, specialists will tell you that eating disorders develop because of a complex mix there going on for that person at that time. They can be psychological, environmental and genetic factors all going on together and just sadly and unfortunately uh, that creating a perfect storm for that person at that moment in time. So just have a little think for yourself now. If I was to ask you what psychological or envir environmental things, i.e. things that happen to people, might be relevant, what might you come up with? What might you have heard of different causes of eating disorders, maybe from people you've spoken to with an eating disorder? What have they told you? When we look at psychological factors, these are just some of them. Um, but, you know, it might be somebody who's been vulnerable to depression or anxiety or who is living with depression or anxiety. They may have low self-esteem, poor self-confidence. They find it really hard to deal with stress. They may have other mental health conditions. They may be somebody who worries a lot about the future. And a, a group of um, personality traits and tendencies, if you like, are often present, not always, but are quite often present. They may be about perfectionist, compulsive or obsessive tendencies. Sometimes they're, they're present. They may have difficulties controlling their emotions, feeling that they have no control, feeling unsafe, and for some reason for them, being able to control what they're eating makes them feel safer. A fear of being fat. So there are many, many reasons. Let's have a look at some of the environmental reasons. There may be pressure at school. There may be bullying. Social media, of course, that can cause a lot of people a lot of angst. They may have experienced trauma or abuse. They may have been criticised for their body shape or their eating habits. They may have difficult family or other relationships. But they may have um, long term physical health conditions as well. And they may also have, for instance, a job or a hobby where being a certain size, weight, shape, etc. is seen as ideal. What can you think of there? What job or hobby might require that? People such as dancers, elite athletes, jockeys, boxers, various things like this. There is an ideal weight uh, or they have to maintain an ideal weight for, for that particular um, hobby, for instance. And when we look at genetic factors, um, it might be changes in the brain, it might be changes around hormone levels, uh, there may be a family history of, of eating disorders or substance misuse as well. And when we look at genetics and family histories, sometimes is it truly genetic or is it learned behaviours within the family? That's how things go in this family. That's what how people are. It might be cultural issues too. OK, so having set the scene in terms of what we're talking about in terms of eating disorders, let's think about, as mental health first aiders, how we can apply algae. So the A of algae, you will remember, stands for that approach, assess and assist. So as mental health first aiders, you might, in one way, one approach that you might come across is that you notice some warning signs in someone, okay? And those warning signs might be some of these. You might notice a dramatic weight loss or gain. Somebody becomes unusually preoccupied with food, weight, calories, dieting. Now, you know, a lot of us occasionally do that, but this is kind of excessively. Um, a lot of anxiety about their weight gain and talking about feeling fat when there is no evidence of that. And in, and in fact, they've lost weight. Somebody embarking on a really excessive and rigid diet or exercise regime. 
Often people will withdraw from family, friends, activities. A lot of activities with our family and friends are around food and people will feel deeply uncomfortable around food and so would rather withdraw. You might also see evidence of huge amounts of um, food being eaten. That might be in terms of packaging that's, bit that's left over or evidence of, of large amounts of food in, in the fridge and cupboards and things like that, and then being consumed. You might see evidence of purging behaviors, noticing that people are, are going to the toilet immediately after eating and maybe um, you know vomiting. Or somebody was telling me the other day that they came across um, a, a lot of laxative packagings um, in somebody's bin. Uh, they'd had a few suspicions and that was kind of a bit of a confirmation for them. And remember in our, our approach assess and assist, we are always assessing, is this person at risk of suicide? So where appropriate, we will be asking about suicidal feelings. People with an eating disorder do have an increased risk as we shall see a little bit later. So that would be also part of our A, approach, assess and assist. Something that a group of people, the dentist, <laughs> um, dentists notice an early warning sign is the erosion of tooth enamel in a particular pattern, which is on the inside of the tooth. Um, so this is indicative of repeated vomiting, for instance, and gastric, uh, gastric acid eroding the tooth enamel. So that might be something, somebody who picks something up too. So this might be somebody who you're concerned about, but it might not be. That might, might not be the approach um, that's needed because what it might be is that somebody might come to you and tell you and disclose to you that they have an eating disorder and that they're currently really struggling. Maybe they're on a waiting list for treatment, for instance. Or the person who you're talking to as a mental health first aider may not have an eating disorder themselves, but they do know somebody who has. That might be a family member or a friend um, or a colleague. And of course, this may have a, a huge effect on them. You know, it might cause them huge levels of uh, stress and worry. And it can be really quite devastating for families when there's somebody in the family with an eating disorder or indeed any other mental illness, of course. So that might be the person who requires your mental health first aider skills. Um, and then, of course, we also know that eating disorders can exist with other mental health issues. So somebody may have a, a personality disorder as well as an eating disorder. They may have bipolar disorder. They may be affected by anxiety, depression, trauma, etc. Um, so they may also become apparent during your conversations. And you might well remember this from your training, that people with an eating disorder are at the highest risk of premature death. They have the highest morbidity rate of all mental health issues. And that's because they, they are at risk of death by suicide, of course. So we would ask clearly and directly about thoughts of suicide where that was appropriate, but also because they can clinically starve themselves and they can do all kinds of damage to their organs, etc. So um, death by, if you like, natural causes is also heightened here as well because of their lack of nutrients. So the L of algae is about listening and communicating non-judgmentally. So when you think of all the listening skills that you learned on your trainings, all of those apply here. And there are gonna be some particularly important ones too. So we're going to highlight a few now. When we are with somebody, we will be reflecting changes in their behavior and not just talking about food related noticings that you've had okay um don't even mention if you can help help it their body size or shape so certainly we wouldn't be criticizing or judging it but um people with an eating disorder can take a seemingly innocuous comment and read a lot into it so for instance you might say something like oh you're looking well uh, and what the person with an eating disorder might get there is they think I'm fat. So just steer away from mentioning 
anything about their body size or shape. Because remember, uh, this is not about food, it's about their feelings. So try not to talk about and get engrossed in conversations about diet and weight loss, etc. That might be a lot of what they want to talk about. And maybe in other arenas, you'll do that. But as a mental health first aider, we'll be thinking about how they're feeling, not um, diets and weight loss, for instance. Um, the place for conversation is certainly not at meal times, which can be very highly charged for families um, at meal times. Uh, so avoid those conversations there, save them for later. What we want to get across to the person is that we are concerned, we do care, and we really want to help them. And if we can approach this and keep as calm as we can, that's going to be really helpful. However, we need to be prepared for some very negative responses um, and, and be super patient here because the person is really scared that you're going to try and stop them doing something. And so they are going to go on the defensive. So that, that negative response to you um, might be them uh, fighting their corner, if you like, being really quite scared, you're going to try and make them change something. We certainly don't want to be assigning guilt to anybody, and we want to avoid blaming anybody or anything. So, um, as I say, that calmness and patience really important. We can express empathy. We may never have had an eating disorder, but we can have had some of the feelings that are, are there. We can treat the person with respect and we can have conversations that are empowering rather than disempowering. Because what we want to do is encourage that person for encourage that person to help seeking behaviors. Whichever way they choose initially, we they we want to encourage that help seeking behavior. So just a little bit more practical stuff, really, on listening skills. Um, a bit of a refresh. You may remember when you did your training um, that we put a lot of emphasis on those open questions. So open questions are ones that cannot easily be answered with a yes or no. So they generally start with who, what, when, where, and why. Um, just use why with a little bit of caution because why can come across as a bit judgmental and a little bit um, accusatory, if you like. So just soften it rather than saying why, just soften it to how come. Um, and you might struggle with asking open questions, but I, ask, I you know, really encourage you to practice, 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 so that then when you need to ask open questions, you can do. Nearly every question we ask um, can be asked in an open way, but we need to practice because generally we ask a lot of closed questions. So one thing that might help you here is the acronym TED. So TED, what that stands for is, the T stands for tell me. So tell me a bit more about that. The E stands for explain. Explain how that made you feel. The D, describe what happened next, etc. You know, these are just suggestions of, of sentence starters. And remember that silence can be powerful, but it can be difficult to hold. We don't like a silence. We want to jump in and fill it. So here's another acronym. The acronym is the word WAIT. W-A-I-T, and that stands for, why am I talking? And one day you might be with somebody and there's a silence and you're feeling uncomfortable and this might just come to your rescue. And you might think, oh, now there was a word. What did Anne-Marie say it was? Oh yes, wait, and what did it stand for? Why am I, oh yes, why am I talking? Ah, yes, and a, a reminder, wait, wait a little bit longer. So it just might buy you a few seconds and be quite useful. And something when we're doing this active listening is to remember this. You've got two ears and one mouth. Use them in that proportion. So you're listening twice as much, if not three times as much as you're speaking. So as well as those open questions, those other little encouraging things, those, mm-hmm, I see, uh-huh, right, go on. Yeah, you know, those little encouraging things that we can do. We don't have to jump in. It's not like a usual conversation. The other pe person should be speaking much more than us. 
So some just some guidance here, and this is in no way a script whatsoever, but some opening questions. I've noticed recently that dot, 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 what, what is it that you've noticed? You've been quieter than usual, for instance. How are things? So these opening questions are not just um, aligned to eating disorders. These might be good opening questions for other situations as well. So I've noticed recently that how are things now how are things is brilliant because it's non-directional the person can pick it up and take it which direction they want to so how are things is great another good opener is how are you coping with that new teacher that new manager uh, that promotion etc so how are you coping with is a, a good opening as well and what difficulties are there at work or home at the moment? How are things outside work or home or school at the moment? And um, so those are some suggestions. Um, you'll find your own way. You'll find your own way of, of asking questions. Um, but the thing is that we don't just think, oh, right, I've asked an open question. Now I can start uh, going on to, you know, giving, fixing people. We don't fix people, do we? We want to keep them talking. So we don't want to jump in with our suggestions too early. We still want to be listening. Um, so we might say things like this. That sounds tricky. That sounds hard. That's a lot to cope with. What have you done about it so far? What are your options? Options is another brilliant word. What would make it easier? What do you need help with? Who is helping you? What help are you getting? So questions like that to keep the conversation there so that you can get a full picture, a fuller picture um, of what's going on for that person before you come in too early with suggestions um, that really wouldn't fit because you've not really listened to their situation. So you might remember next is our G, give support and information. Uh, just a reminder here, not advice. We don't give advice. It might be received as advice, but we do not give advice. Um, so what we are going to be giving is reassurance. Lots of reassurance here. We're here to help and to support. If we treat this person in front of us with respect and dignity, kindness and compassion, we are going to build up that rapport much more, more quickly. And we might be the only person recently who has treated them with respect and kindness, dignity and compassion. OK, because maybe a lot of other people um, have got fed up with them and are angry with them, etc. So we've got a different approach. Um, it says here, don't force change. You can't force change. So don't even go down that, that path. Um, but we will be offering support and encouraging them to get treatment. The person may well deny and become defensive, as I said earlier, may well come out fighting. So don't give up. It might take some time. You know, leave some uh, ideas, leave some resources and be patient. I'm going to show you lots of resources uh, later on. And there are lots of different types of resources. And I'm a big believer in giving people lots of options. Uh, so that might be books, it might be posters, it might be an app, it might be a TED talk, etc. cetera. Um, so giving in, in different ways, um, plenty of ideas for when they might feel a bit stuck and think, oh, maybe I will look at that thing now, actually. Um, so the first E of algae is encouraging that professional help. When we talk about people who are um, potentially having a diagnosis of an eating disorder, they are going to need a full physical health checkup. So the GP is going to be the most important um, person here. Um, that's both for that diagnosis, that full checkup, and the referral to specialists. So if, if a child is, is um, considered likely to have an eating disorder, they should be referred to the Children and Adolescent Mental Health Service. You might hear it referred to as CAMS. Adults should be re referred to the Community Mental Health Team or CMHT. However, some recent research has shown that around two thirds are not getting those CAMS two thirds of children are not getting those CAMS referrals. 
and this is the nice guidelines. Um, and some of that might well be around the fact that GPs experience has been that they refer people to CAMS and they don't meet the criteria and they are referred back to the GP for care. And so, you know, they're kind of thinking, you know, there's not a lot of point. Um, however, you have the right to insist on getting a, a, a specialist opinion. And for people with anorexia, they may receive their treatment at home in the community, or they may be um, uh, referred to the, an inpatient unit. The treatment is going to be a combination of medication for that underlying um, emotional and, and mental illness that might be going on underneath there, tra um, trauma, anxiety, depression, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's a combination of medication and therapy. And this is not going to be a quick fix. This is not going to be six sessions um, of, of CBT, for instance. You know, we are talking often about many uh, months and months of treatment. And um, there is a mantra, there is something called mantra that you can investigate in uh, the London Centre there. Uh, this is for adults with anorexia. And so you can see something of the pathway of treatment there. Um, for bulimia and for uh, binge eating, actually, there are specially adapted cognitive behaviour therapies. And the person may also need other kinds of therapy like interpersonal psychotherapy, etc. And again, not a quick fix. It's going to take many, many months and there may be a need for medication for any underlying um, conditions. So binge eating... Um, as I said, specially adapted cognitive behaviour therapy. And there's also a modified version of dialectical behaviour therapy or DBT, which is often used for people with a personality disorder. And again, there may be a, a need for medication. Um, the aim here is for to get the person to a safe weight, let's put it that way first, and then a healthy weight. Um, and also at the same time, have a healthy relationship with food. So for that reason, there may need to be a lot of different professionals required. So there may be a psychiatrist, there may be psychiatric nurses, dietitians, nutritionists, etc. The other thing to say here is that if it's a child, the whole family should also receive therapeutic support too. There's no point in just treating a child, maybe taking them to an inpatient unit for many months and then returning them to exactly the same situation. There may be some psychoeducation and some therapy needed within the family too. So there is that wraparound care. Um, as we said, any underlying mental illnesses will have their own treatment pathways as well. And these cases, some cases can be extremely complex where there are comorbidities or where there are many other conditions also diagnosed. So somebody with a, a personality disorder and an eating disorder is going to be more complex. Somebody with bipolar disorder and an eating disorder uh, and depression, for instance, is going to be uh, more complex to treat. Just over the last year, so this is in the last year of the pandemic, there's been a 140% increase in hospital admissions. So those are admissions both in general hospitals where sometimes people uh, require admission to a general hospital first to um, have nasogastric feeding, to have intravenous fluids uh, where life can be really at risk and then they may be transferred to an inpatient unit. So hospital admissions in general hospitals and in psychiatric units have increased 140%. So something you know, really significant over the COVID pandemic has happened in terms of eating disorders and um, the uh, distress of our young people, but not only young people, as we saw earlier. Now, remember, fascinating as all this is and knowing therapy for this and therapy for that and diagnosis, as mental health first aiders, we do not diagnose. It's really good for us to have a running knowledge of uh, diagnoses and treatments etc but that is not our role so I'm just pulling you back from that to remind you as a mental health first aider you have your specific role and that is not around diagnosis. What about other supports? We're going to also be thinking about other supports. 
Um, really valuing the person for who they are and not how they look. Do you remember earlier we said, you know, steer away from comments about their body size and weight. And so it might be valuing them for something uh, completely different, nothing to do with that. So it might be something like you say, oh, I loved how kind you were to your sister earlier. It was really kind how you did that thing for them, how you helped her. Um, could be other things. Oh, thank you so much for helping me with that Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you know, I really struggled to get my head around them. Your help was just invaluable. Thank you. Or, you know, you were so persistent. Well done for keeping on trying. I know that wasn't easy. I know you're trying to learn the guitar, for instance, and it's really hard. Well done for persisting. So those kind of things. Um, and empowering people to take care of their well-being. Um, what we need here is for the person to have lots and lots of helpful coping strategies. And one way, um, you know, very simplistic way and a basic way to look at an eating disorder is to think that at some point when it first started, this seemed to that person, you know, often a, a young person, um, it seemed like a helpful coping strategy. They got something out of it. So whatever the distress that they were feeling, they felt some element maybe of control, for instance. Ah, this is something I can control. What we want to build up is lots of helpful coping strategies because this is like a, a strategy that's gone wrong. Um, and so we want lots of helpful coping strategies. And I often think of it in this way. If I couldn't swim and you put me in the deep end of a swimming pool, um, my coping strategy, my one and only, that it would be to cling onto the side um, and to get out as soon as possible if I could, but I'd be clinging onto the side. I wouldn't be enjoying myself. I wouldn't be have any fun in there. I'd be clinging to the side. Now, a helpful coping strategy would be for me to perhaps use some sort of a flotation, one of those noodles or a float or something. Um, another helpful coping strategy might be for me to get some swimming lessons. And then I might be willing to let go of the side of the swimming pool. And in exactly the same way, we can encourage people to have helpful and positive coping strategies. You know, we might just be slightly loosening the grip of this eating disorder. So remember from your mental health first aid training, there's five ways to well-being. Are they in balance for the person? And you can go through what they are with them. The action for happiness, the 10 keys to happiness there. Um, again, that's something to perhaps go through. Um, wellness recovery action planning. Um, this again is in your manual. And um, any other helpful coping strategies that you can think of to get them involved in positive behaviours, really. A good education. It's going to be needed around food. And if we can get the, you know, really inspiring dietitian or nutritionist involved uh, with them to make them curious about food, not afraid of food, not seeing food as some kind of an enemy or to be, you know, to be avoided, but really having a positive association and relationship with foods really necessary, for, especially for that long term recovery. Um, there are lots of different apps and books and TED Talks, and I'll be directing you to some a little bit further on. Um, guided self-help. This can often, as a first-line treatment, be quite helpful, especially if you're sitting on a waiting list, for instance. So the, the, um, the Eating Disorders Charity Beat are brilliant for this, and I'll be giving you some links there. But what we're talking about here is building a life where that person uh, fits where they have got a reason to stay alive, if you like. Uh, that could be creativity, it could be a hobby, it could be a new job, it could be a new studying um, pathway. It could be many, many things, but a place where that person wants to stay. And hearing lots of different stories of things that helped for other people can be useful too. Two things I'd like to tell you about um, that you may or may not be aware of. The first is recovery colleges. So find your local one. There are over 100 around the UK. They're not a statutory provision, but lots of areas have them. Find out what goes on at yours. Certainly, there should be things like the five ways to well-being and the wellness reaction, uh, well, 
oh, sorry, Wellness Recovery Action Planning or RAP. But lots of other things go on in Recovery College where people learn to care for themselves and they're very empowering. So find your local one, see what goes on there. And the other one is social prescribers. And these are people who kind of prescribe, if you like, non-clinical things. So they're often the things that, you know, uh, GPs might have liked to have done, but they've only got 10 minutes when they see you. Um, but you can make an appointment to, um, to spend some time with a social prescriber who will know what's going on in your area. What are the groups? What are the, what facilities are there? What services are they, et cetera? worth their weight in gold so find out where your local recovery college is and how people access their social prescribers because there are different arrangements in different areas so i've got a video to show you now and i just before i do that i just want to give you a bit of a health and safety warning um, in this video we see uh jody and jody was extremely unwell with anorexia and in the video, you will be shown images of her when she was very unwell, really skeletally thin, receiving treatment with a nasogastric tube. And these can be shocking and triggering. If you are not feeling up to that, please just skip forward. Uh, the video goes on for seven minutes. So either step away or skip, the, uh, skip forward. But ultimately, it's really insightful what Jodie explains, very insightful. Uh, and it's a really rewarding watch because it's a story of survival and recovery. However, I just do want to give you that health and safety warning about it being a difficult watch. So here we go. If you wanted to watch it again, by the way, that's the link there. It is available on YouTube. Anorexia kind of takes on a persona and becomes this this person in your life rather than being something that is you. It's about separation between her and you. She's nasty. Anorexia is always, always nasty. If you lose a bit of weight, then for five minutes she's praising you and telling you that you look fabulous with this new weight loss. And then she'll go back to, but you're still fat. She is just this horrible bully that I have to live with. That's who I have to contend with all my life. Anorexia is telling me that I'm doing really, really well. And the doctors and nurses are telling me that I'm going to die. I was 15 when I got diagnosed with the anorexia. I was quite a tomboy. I mean, I was always up trees or scraping my knees and playing football and sports. <laughs> Jenny and I met in year eight. If she'd stay over my house to get like movie snacks and stuff, we'd go over the road in like onesies and stupid makeup and it's all very embarrassing. I started school um, and I got bullied through school, so I sort of kind of channeled my energy into my studying instead. And I had a lot of issues um, from the bullying about my body image and how I felt about myself. And I was always quite insecure of myself, I think, after that. I think I became kind of isolated, which then led me to study a lot. And that kind of added to the pressure of just wanting to be good enough. At college, she was like wearing baggier clothes, and like, she'd wear really oversized jumpers and stuff to kind of, I guess, like hide the fact she was losing so much weight, but you could still see it in her face. She'd um, weigh out her food quite a lot um, and be like really specific on measurements. If you had a bag of crisps or like a bag of chocolate or something, you'd offer it, she'd always say no, like always. 
The anorexia began with sort of the calorie counting idea of, oh, let's stick with this many calories a day. And she manipulates you to get your calorie amount to go down each day. And as soon as I'd eaten something, I instantly wanted to exercise it off. It turns you against everyone. It doesn't want you to be friends with anyone. It doesn't want you to feel love because she acts as though she's your friend. We was really close. Um, before the anorexia, and then when the anorexia came, it pushed us quite far apart. Anorexia hated my mum and dad and my nan and granddad because they were the ones that was trying to help me. Quite often, Jodie would say she would hate me and want me dead. She bit me quite hard. She would pin me against the wall, but I could see it wasn't her. It was always the anorexia doing that. She was a split personality, Jodie, at that time. Once you're in the state that Jodie was in, when she was at her worst, like, there was hardly any of Jodie left. I made a doctor's appointment and we went from there, really. I went straight from the general hospital to the inpatient unit, which was really, really hard. It was hard because her sugar levels kept dropping. They were worried she would go into a sugar coma. Um, her heart rate was extremely, extremely low. It was quite a, a muddle, really, is how I could describe it, because I wasn't, wasn't with it a lot of the time. The doctors were telling everyone to say goodbye at this point, you know, Nan and Grandad came down and everything, because they thought it was going to be their last moments with me. So the inpatient unit was quite um, a competitive environment. I mean, the problem is when you've got a group of girls on a table all eating together or with the same anorexic voice, it becomes a challenge as to who can eat the slowest or who can not finish their food, who will finish first. Daddy and daughter making dinner. And cat. I had a light bulb moment after dinner. Um, me and my dad would always go for a walk um, and we'd always go around the block. And one day I got to the end of the road and I let go of his hand and he said, what's wrong? And I said, well, the anorexia is telling me I need to walk around the rest of this block. I need to complete my walk. But my heart's actually telling me I'm not going to make it there. And I think I'd crushed her instantly in that moment of, I really don't like you anymore. I don't want you in my life. I don't want you in my head. <laughs> One of the biggest hurdles was the voice getting louder because when you begin to rebel against her obviously she's she's not gonna like it so she starts to scream at you and she really does get loud I made an Instagram called um, Jodie Eats to Live and that was a username decided by me mum and dad so and we thought it was quite accurate to describe the journey I was going through although I was against social media at the time actually it's, it's made Jodie a stronger person I think her Instagram actually really helped her, like being able to document it. It was kind of like a food diary. A fear food challenge is, you know, eating a food that you find particularly scary, um, whether it be sort of like a sweeter food, um, you know, where the sugar content's maybe a little bit higher, or more of a savoury food that is a bit starchy and makes you feel full up. Shaking whilst putting the ham on my thin, but here is my thin. Jodie Eats to Live kind of began as a story for myself to get through it. And then as I got through it, it became a story for me to help everyone else. I keep motivated because I try now and look at what I didn't have and what I have and what I could have. Now I've been weight restored for about, coming up to two years actually. I just can't describe it in words, <laughs> really. I'm just feeling really grateful to be here today. Yeah, there we go. My teenage years, they weren't great, but we can sort of move on from that. Wish for a bigger cake. <laughs> I'm going to make a wish first. My 20s are going to be a new chapter for me, a completely new start of my life. You know, I'm going to take things from such a different perspective and keep positive and they're going to be the best. Okay, so I hope everybody's okay after watching that. It was quite a challenging watch, but I hope you felt it was worthwhile. Um, 
ultimately a success story and recovery and survival. If you need to step away for a few minutes, please feel free to. Um, so I've mentioned it before, but I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on the Beat Eating Disorder Charity, which is a, a really excellent charity doing so much work in this arena. We're doing a lot of things like research, etc., as well as supporting people. Um, so they have lots of different helplines and support groups. Um, so some of the contact details are there. So there are helplines for younger people, for adults, for family members. There are online support groups for all kinds of different eating disorders. Um, they've got a wonderful website with lots of information and resources available to download. There's plenty of education there about eating disorders. Um, during the pandemic, they set up Solace. Well, I think it was during the pandemic. They set up Solace, which was um, a support group for um, anybody supporting somebody. So maybe a family member or a friend who's supporting somebody with an eating disorder. Um, so they are innovative. They're always trying new things, etc. So really, really recommend them. And uh, I recommend them also for you as a mental health first aider. If you know that you're going to be having a conversation with somebody um, about an eating disorder and you're feeling a bit wobbly, you can always ring their helpline yourself and say, I'm going to have this conversation. What are the key things? What are the key things that you do that I could perhaps be signposting them to? So you can make use of them yourself as a mental health first aider too. So some of their resources are, you know, they make them accessible and fun. And, um, you know, you could put something like this uh, leaflet, you could print this off and put this in places where people gather, for instance, whether that was kitchens or uh, photocopiers or, um, you know, backs of toilet doors are a great place to put some of these well-being messages. You just have to keep changing them after a couple of weeks because people don't see them anymore. Um, but this one, for instance, um, all ending in IPS. What are the warning signs? Lips, flips, hips, kips, nips, skips. So you can see that they're trying to, you know, appeal in a, a non-threatening, non-challenging way. So well worth uh, looking on their website. See what else you can find on there that might be useful for you. And what about other resources? Um, so a workbook for anybody who is concerned about their eating, you can look at even if you not, might not be in the, the places where these are, you can still look on their website and get access to their resources. Uh, so there's a workbook on the Norfolk uh, Community Eating Disorder Service that you can access there. Um, there's also something called Freed Beaches, which is another uh, online resource that you might find you know, useful for yourself. Um, Eva Musby uh, has a, a website called Anorexia Family, and on there, there's a really great video for parents um, trying to explain to parents what are the do's and the don'ts about trying to encourage your, your child to eat, however big or small your child is. It's really, really good, very uh, cleverly done as well. So you can um, access that on her website. Um, in terms of an app, uh, this one here, Recovery Warriors, um, is a good one. In terms of books, there's a couple of books here that are on the books on prescription list that you might find useful. Some people might prefer to uh, read a book. Um, in terms of TV, you might have seen uh, Freddie Flintoff did a documentary on the BBC on the topic of bulimia. Christopher Eccleston has a video on um, the Beat website, actually, that you can watch. And Louis Theroux has done some BBC documentaries. So sometimes you can access these either uh, through the um, BBC, for instance, or through YouTube. As well as Beat, there are other charities as well. So here are a few details of anorexia and bulimia care, eating disorders support. Um, so, you know, you, you please just look at all your options. Look at all the tone. It might be something about the tone that you prefer in one to another, um, but the details are here. There's also something called Feast Around the Table, which is something I came across more recently. This is a parents forum, which is well moderated um, for parents to discuss how distressing and upsetting it is to have a child with an eating disorder. Uh, so it's a, a quite a good forum. You can uh, access it there. 
Um, so find out what your local eating disorder service is, where it is, how you access it. I mean, people have to be referred to it via their GP, but you can find out what they have. So for instance, where I'm based in Berkshire, and actually in many other areas too, people are given uh, access to something called Sharon, which is an online peer support um, offering that's there 24 seven. Um, but that's not available to everybody everywhere. So see what there is. So this is about giving hope to people that there are resources in many different forms. If you know any other, I would just put a big health and safety warning here. Be very careful about social media sites. Make sure they are reputable uh, because some of them are deeply unhelpful and are actively encouraging eating disorders. Competitive, who weighs less? Competitive, who eats the least, et cetera, et cetera. Please only use the reputable resources that we recommend unless you find something that you can um, assess yourself as safe. And know this, eating disorders can be very challenging. Treatment can take a long time. Professional help is going to be needed both for the person, but also for their family too. Get help from any of those organisations who you find most, most helpful for you, whether it's for yourself, a family member, or somebody that you're supporting. As mental health first aiders, our consistent, important word, calm and respectful approach is required, but also be prepared for that resistance as well. Because the message here is that there is hope. Recovery is both possible and likely. And especially when we have the early intervention of clinicians, therapists, family, friends, and all the other resources that we've mentioned. It takes time, but remember this, if you think about food, it's everywhere. And every day you have to make several decisions about food. Um, so, you know, this is always something that might be that relationship with food, those associations with food have to be fixed firmly for that person, um, because in order for them to go forth into the world um, recovered, they're going to be, need that positive association uh, with food. And remember, as a mental health first aider, if I'm saying to you that eating disorders can be very challenging, remember to consider your own well-being. It matters hugely. Think about your helpful coping strategies. What do you need to do? Perhaps you need to talk it over, of course, thinking about confidentiality. Um, but maybe you need to have a rest. Maybe you need to go for a brisk walk. Maybe you need to take a shower. Whatever your helpful coping strategies are, remember your well-being matters. And also a, a final reminder about remembering the boundaries of your role as a mental health first aider. We don't diagnose, we don't treat, we are not therapists. We have an important role um, around that listening and signposting and encouraging, etc. But remember the boundaries of it. So thank you very much for joining us today. And I hope you found it really useful. I hope it gave you a few more insights and a few more resources. If you want to find anything else about me, um, there's my details and there's a Mental Health First Aid England website at the bottom. So I hope you will um, go forward with more confidence as mental health first aiders. So thank you very much for being with us today. <laughs>